Well, hi, everybody. I'm Don Stewart, and welcome to another edition of Breaking News for this Saturday, the 17th day of August 2024. And each day here that we do breaking news, what we do is look at what the Bible has to say first and foremost about the time of the end, that is the time before Jesus Christ returns and the many events that will precede it, and what our world looks like in getting set up for what Scripture predicts. And as always, we are amazed to see things falling into place so minutely, so specifically, that it is really mind-boggling to see and to understand. And that's why we do this, to show you that the Bible is what it claims to be, the word of the living God. It tells us exactly what's going to happen in the future. It's totally trustworthy. And the two stories we're going to look at today, um, amazingly, again, amazingly confirm this. So let's look at it. Now, the first story, let's give you some background. Remember when we talk about the Ezekiel 38, 39 scenario that Israel is going to be invade, invaded sometime in the future? One of the things that's going to happen is they're going to be taken by surprise. They're not going to be expecting anybody to invade them. In other words, the people, particularly on their northern border in Lebanon, will not have the firepower, the manpower, or basically even the desire to destroy Israel. And as we know, that's not the case now. We've got Hezbollah there. And they are, are ready, willing, and able to destroy Israel. They're a surrogate of Iran. And what we see in this first headline is really, really interesting because it sets the stage for seemingly what must happen. That is Israel to take out what's going on there in Lebanon with Hezbollah. Listen to the headline. Is Hezbollah giving Netanyahu an, an excuse to attack? The tunnel video sparks controversy in Lebanon. Lebanese outrage at relatively comfortable conditions and futuristic-looking underground facilities showcased in terror groups' propaganda video as country endures a crippling energy crisis. If Hezbollah can build tunnels, why can't they provide electricity and water to their communities? Hezbollah's release of a video on Friday showcasing a futuristic-looking underground military facility dubbed Imad 4 has generated significant reactions, particularly from critics of the Shiite terrorist group. The video, which revealed a well-equipped underground bunker, has drawn attention for the stark contrast between the conditions inside the tunnel and the dire situation above the ground, where Lebanese citizens are facing severe shortages, including lack of shelters. One Lebanese journalist claimed that the video serves Israel's interest. Now, here's what's fascinating. Is Hezbollah giving Netanyahu an excuse to attack Lebanon with his Imad 4 video? Does anyone think this deters Netanyahu's madness, she questioned. Now, many Lebanese citizens responding to the video expressed disbelief at the resources displayed in the tunnel, including lighting and water, while the country endures a crippling energy crisis. One social media user wrote, If Hezbollah can build tunnels, why can't they provide electricity and water to their communities? Samir Yerjeria one of the leaders of the Christian-based Lebanese Forces Party and a vocal Hezbollah critic, responded to the video by questioning the Iran-aligned Iran group's priorities. Where were these facilities when the death toll exceeded 500? Hezbollah cannot dictate Lebanon's fate through war, he said, adding that the tunnels are funded by Tehran and do not serve Lebanese interests. Isn't, isn't that the truth? This video, which shows trucks moving through the well-lit tunnels, also revealed underground missile launch platforms and the facility's name. Hezbollah affiliated al Mayadi network said that the video demonstrated the secrecy surrounding Hezbollah's missile capabilities, emphasizing that the facility is deep underground, beyond the reach of hostile intelligence, and protected, protected from aerial strikes. The release of the video coincides with threats from Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, about the group's military capabilities. The video highlights Hezbollah's extensive network of tunnels, which, which includes large underground bases across Lebanon, including in the southern region's Beirut Dahia district and the Bekaa Valley. These tunnels, believed to house key military assets, such as missile launchers, armed drones, and command centers, are strategically placed under civilian areas, making them difficult to target without ground operations. Similar to Hamas, Hezbollah is thought to keep its most critical assets, including weapons and senior commanders, hidden in these underground bunkers, safeguarding them from airstrikes and making them accessible only through ground maneuvers. All right, that's the story. Now, here's the bottom line of this. You see in these this tunnel structure that's there, the uh, what we've been talking about for a long time and it's what's been promoted 
that Hezbollah has an amazing array of tunnels that are much more sophisticated than what we see in Gaza with very sophisticated weapons they are also you know, able to reach Israel. Now, Israel sooner or later has to do something about this. And like the article said, this should all the more cause Israel, Netanyahu and the government to want to destroy Hezbollah there once and for all to get rid of them, to get rid of this, this blight that's right on their northern border that's been there basically since 2006, after the 2006 war that finished. And so the bottom line of all this is what this tunnel does is give Israel, like the article said, the motivation to really do something, not just do something back and forth, a little tit for tat they've been doing uh, for the last 10 months, but really destroy what's there in the uh, ter uh, territory of Lebanon so they won't have to worry in the future about some type of attack coming from Hezbollah. And remember, what does the Bible tell us? When they are attacked at the time of the end, uh, they're not going to be expecting it. They're going to have a surprise attack led by Russia and its surrogates that are going to come from north, south, east, and west, but they're not going to be worried about someone right on their northern border or on any of their borders, by the way, because none of the countries that border Israel are going to be attacking. They're countries that come from outside of that. So to me, it was fascinating to read this article to see that um, it's almost like, like the article says, they're inviting Netanyahu to come and destroy them. Because what we are going to eventually see, you know, we may never live to see it, but it's going to happen, that there'll be peace all around, seeming peace for Israel, at least a lack of hostilities there, when they will be eventually invaded, according to the predicted Ezekiel 38-39 invasion. But they got to take care of Lebanon first. They got to take care of Hezbollah. That cannot be in existence when this uh, invasion takes place, because remember, the key point of the invasion is they're invaded when they're not expecting it. They're, they're come, there's armies coming in. And again, this is boots on the ground from north, south, east, and west. And it's going to catch them by surprise. Now, that was the first story. Now, the second one here is even more amazing. It's called the Quiet War, Quiet World War, Behind the Struggles in the Middle East. This is the global map of interest in the Middle East. And what this story does is lay out the different players right now and what their goals are. And it's going to be amazing as we read this, how it fits so well with what the Bible says, who the players are going to be and where the lineups are going to take place. Let's read it. Israel's war is a part of a broader global confrontation involving major powers whose involvement is in the region is increasing. On one side is the United States aiming to strengthen alliances with moderate Arab states. And the other side is Russia, tightening its ties with Iran, along with China and North Korea, seeking to weaken its Western rivals. Now, let's stop right there for a second. Russia is going to be the one that's front and center in this last day's invasion, as we have mentioned. The United States is going to be a non-player, even though they may have sought to have some type of interest in the Middle East. They're going to lose all interest for one reason or another. They're not going to be a player. So it's interesting. We have this mentioned, but notice also who is mentioned with Russia, Iran, which will be one of the countries that Scripture mentions, Persia, that's going to be there, ancient Iran, modern day, uh, ancient Persia, modern day Iran, is going to be one of the countries that invade. Now, Henry Kissinger, as the article reads, famously remarked, that Israel has no foreign policy, only domestic policy. But right now, that statement seems to apply equally to the United States. For the Biden administration, U.S. foreign policy is less than 100 days left before the election boils down to one goal, preventing a full-scale war in the Middle East, especially one that might involve American troops and exacerbate the sense of chaos that benefits Donald Trump and could lead to his re-election. Beyond the immediate political calculations, Preventing a regional war has been a primary focus for the Biden administration since October 7th. The administration has largely given Israel free reign in Gaza. Well, that's not really true. While clearly concentrating on the broader threats posed by Iran and its proxies. The U.S. has targeted proxy groups and issued particularly strong warnings to hostile actors in the region from Hezbollah and the Houthis. Their highly publicized military movements in recent weeks are designed to keep the situation from spiraling out of control, a task that has become much more difficult even in the last two weeks. In the longer term, the U.S. is working to strengthen its alliances in the Arab world, particularly with Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Qatar. Now, again, Saudi Arabia and Qatar will be two of the nations that protest this invasion. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? to um, Russia, Iran, Turkey, and these other nations that uh, are involved. So they're mentioned here now, and they are, again, uh, they try to be neutral in the sense, particularly the Saudis, because they're afraid if they join in with, uh, you know, they, Iran is going to take care of them next. In other words, 
basically, if Iran would, I mean, we know that's not going to happen from scripture. If Iran wiped out Israel, the next country would take out is Saudi Arabia because they want to be the leader in the area. But that, again, bottom line is uh, what's frustrating here is they say they're strengthening ties between the U.S. and the Saudis. And um, as the election approaches, approaches the tension, the U.S. is already at unhealthy levels and it's only going to increase. So you've got all these players lined up exactly in the position we would expect to see them in. You have R R Russia on the outside right now supporting Iran. Iran will basically be a surrogate of Russia. You have Turkey, which is supporting Iran already, right? And you have the, the Saudis, the Gulf states, basically try to get some type of relationship with Israel. These are the nations that will protest. Now, they won't help out Israel militarily, but they're also wanting to side with them because they're afraid of Iran, what they might do to them next. So anyway, this is all setting up uh, exactly for what the scripture has to say. Now, the article goes on to say, the last thing the Democrats need is for the Middle East to dominate the headlines again. Kamala Harris, the Democratic presidential nominee, made it a clear campaign made it clear at a campaign rally two days ago that she does not intend to let Gaza become a burden as it was for Biden. When pro-Palestinian protesters interrupted her speech at a massive rally in Detroit, she let them shout for a moment before saying, if you want Trump to win, keep going. If not, I'm speaking now. While this may cause her some trouble with the left, the applause from the crowd suggested that most Democrats do not really want to hear more about the Middle East and the Biden administration will do everything possible to ensure they don't have to, at least till no Till, until November 5th. Here it comes. Russia, in its own view, is a global player equal to the U.S. Its foreign policy is driven by this assumption and aims to diminish America's influence, power, and status worldwide, including in the Middle East. Now, let's read that again and think about this in light of what the Bible says. Russia is the big player in the last days in the Middle East. United States is nowhere to be seen. And what does it say about Russia? Their foreign policy is driven by the by this assumption to become you know a, a player in the Middle East and to to diminish America's influence, power and status worldwide including the Middle East. And it goes on to talk about the invasion of Ukraine created unprecedented tension with Washington and many Western democracies, while also tightening Russia's ties with China, here we go, with Iran and North Korea, emphasizing security co cooperation among the nations. And it goes on to say these, this Russia, China, Iran, North Korea access is united by heavy sanctions imposed on each of them by the U.S., and they all aim to reduce America's dominance and shift the global order from a U.S.-led unipolar world to a multipolar world. And again, the U.S. is the and has been the major superpower in the world. And sign number of 11, sign number 11 or 25 signs is there won't be a superpower in the United States to stop Russia from invading. And this is precisely what Russia is attempting to do along with these surrogates here. Anyway, bottom line is, and here's the, the, um, the, the conclusion, weakening U.S. power and influence, including in the Middle East, is a top priority for Moscow and almost any means to achieve this goal is considered acceptable. Continued tension and possibly an escalation to a full-scale war could greatly serve Russia's interest, strengthening its regional standing, just as the U.S. influence in the Middle East is steadily declining. Now, isn't that fast, fascinating what they say? Russia's interest could be strengthened by a regional war. They're looking for their status to increase as the status of the U.S. is steadily declining. That's precisely what we expect to see at the time of the end. U.S. is not a player. Russia is the is the big power there in the Middle East. So the point of all this is, is, is just incredible when we think about it, because these players are named. Now, the United States isn't named, obviously. They're conspicuous by their absence. But we have Russia, we have Iran, we have Turkey, all named in Scripture as the players that will be there in the invasion of Israel. But Russia will be the one that exercises power in the Middle East, able to bring a coalition together. Now, again, we document this very fully in our book, 25 Signs. We're near the end, particularly Signs 9 through 11, about the last day's invasion there. How um, there be certain people that sit out, certain people that invade, and the U.S. not being a player. So uh, what we see right now is everything coming together in such an incredibly specific, amazing way that uh, we can't let it escape it. It's mind-boggling. Again, Russia's attempted influence to make themselves more influential in the world, particularly the Middle East, and we see the decline of the United States. Now, this was not true just a few years ago. It was the United States that was the big power in the Middle East in the world, and Russia was, was a non-player. 
But again, we wait long enough and scripture will be fulfilled. So like this first story that's basically saying that Lebanon or Hezbollah more, more precisely, uh, basically is egging on Netanyahu to do something to fight. And if they do, they will be destroyed, at least, you know, put out of power. That's going to eventually happen, number one. Then number two, with the world players, what's going on, Russia, front and center, try to increase its influence. What we see is scripture said it's going to happen. In the United States, influence is waning and it's going to continue to get worse and worse. And like the article said, interesting, a regional war would do a lot to give Russia's credibility in the area because Russia can come in afterwards. See, they haven't been involved in any way. They haven't been involved in any army or military. They can become the good cop and help everything out. And Israel, unfortunately, will trust them at the time of the end when this invasion takes place, according to Ezekiel 38, 39, not expecting it to come from their good friend Russia at this future time. So again, like we see here every day with so many specific details that are being fulfilled right in front of our very eyes, that uh, the scripture as always is 100% uh, accurate, but it's giving us what it's telling us. We can trust God, the God of the Bible, who's told us this ahead of time who told us we can know what's going on and who can t told us what we should expect to see. And we're seeing it get fulfilled right now. We're seeing the stage get set. And so as we deal with every day here on breaking news, story after story, it's it's literally incredible that and how mind boggling that we're able to live at this time and see these things. And let's not take it for granted. Let's be thankful that we're here for such a time as this anyway. Uh, I'm Don Stewart. Thanks so much for watching. Again, we're in a holding pattern with respect to what's going to take place with the regional war. Something's going to happen very soon, though. We know after this coming week with this hostage crisis uh, ceasefire deal that's certainly not going through. So anyway, uh, until we hear something or uh, tomorrow morning, as always, as I'm Don Stewart, thanking you so much for watching, for praying for us, or being part of this, for letting others know about what's going on here. And again, may the Lord richly, richly bless you.